Every once in a while, you just need to look at someone and smile. It's all right. Shake a hand. We're starting a new series this morning. It's called uh, uh, Finding Jesus. And we're going to be talking about a, a bunch of different ways in which we do that when we're stuck at some things in our lives. And so the first one we're going to talk about this morning is how do you find Jesus when you're lost? And so uh, I don't know if any of you have ever uh, are good at getting lost. I'm like almost at expert level. <laughs> I think uh, smartphones were invented for people like me because uh, GPS is a necessary uh, thing for where I go, but I don't just get lost doing things like finding a place I've never been to before. Uh, I, I'm just, I'm good at, hey, on a youth group trip, we're gonna go hiking out in the woods, <laughs> stay with the group, okay, I find myself lost uh, all the time. One of the things you're told to do when you're lost is what in the woods? Anybody? Stay put. Stay put. Uh, sometimes they tell you to do things like uh, hug a tree. I didn't listen to those things. You know what I normally do is I think because I'm such a smart guy, I can find my way to where I need to be. And I don't know if you've ever done this, but usually when you try to find your own way back, you just find yourself getting more lost. And so I look around, I'm running on a trail, and I go, that looks familiar. I'm going to go that way. Well, I don't know about you, but when you're in the woods, a tree is a tree, and a trail is a trail. And if it just keep going, one time I made the mistake of going, well, there's tire tracks on this trail, so it has to at least lead to a road. No, it doesn't. It doesn't have to. It leads to a dead end sometimes. And so I find myself in the middle of the woods, uh, up and past Georgetown, running lost and ragged, uh, only to find my way back eventually seven hours later. Uh, luckily, because I think uh, I thought I was going to get eaten by a mountain lion because I heard things in the bushes, it could have just been a bird. But I never ran as fast as you can imagine. But <laughs> sometimes uh, we just need to stay put, hug a tree, wait until somebody finds you. You're not that far off the trail, but when we try our, our hardest on our own, we end up not knowing what direction uh, we're in. And so we're sitting there, not one direction, the two girls that are over there, just <laughs> no direction whatsoever. So what we need to do today, the only person I can find in all of scripture who learned how to hug a tree the right way is a little man named Zacchaeus. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 19. Uh, this morning. Uh, if you know about Zacchaeus, you know that he was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. So he climbed himself up the sycamore tree, because you know the song. But Zacchaeus was a little guy, but not only that, he was not a good guy. Zacchaeus, I don't know how he found his way here, because we know that he is a son of Abraham, uh, which means he is also uh, one of the Jews. But he found himself being a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. So in verses 1 through 2, when Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through, a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. We find out later that Zacchaeus made all of his wealth off of ripping off other people. He was not a good man. Uh, I'm pretty sure he probably had a Napoleon complex too, which probably made him a fiery little man as well. And so, if you think about what Zacchaeus is leading up to this point, we know that he, at, somewhere along the line, found himself being a cheat, a liar, uh, and found himself very wealthy, but also found himself very unhappy. We don't know much about him beforehand, but, you know, it's, it's, there's something that, that stuck out to me when I was looking this uh, story up and I was doing some research. Zacchaeus' name in Hebrew means innocent and pure. Isn't that incredible? Because he is not so innocent nor so pure at this point of the story. But it makes me think about his parents. It makes me think about his upbringing. Normally we don't name uh, a kid uh, unless, well, it's not true because the scriptures has led us to some weird names for people, like in the book of uh, Hosea. But normally you don't name your kid awful and terrible and cheat and liar. You don't normally do that. Uh, I think they looked at Zacchaeus and saw his cute little face and inspired, were inspired that he would be something different. That he would be a, a good person, pure and innocent. 
Is that what his name was? But instead, he found himself at a point where he is in life with no direction. He thought what he wanted would make him happy, I'm assuming, because he's very wealthy, and he's a chief tax collector, so he's probably a little powerful. But he hears about something going on, and he hears about a man named Jesus, and he hears about his teachings, and he wants to know about him. So when I think of that, and I think about, you know, when we see something that we, we need to hear about, it's changing us, we're not happy with where we're at. Zacchaeus made a point to do something here in the next uh, um, part of the scripture, and it was to hug a tree. <laughs> When we hug a tree, and if you're a Boy Scout, you have a little whistle in your backpack too. You sit there, you hug the tree, and you blow your whistle in hopes that what? That you're found. Sometimes in finding Jesus, when we're lost, it's not about us actively seeking him out and finding him. It's learning ways to stay put so that we can be found by him. Zacchaeus had already done a lot of things on his own. He already found his way to where he was at, and everything that he's earned up to this point was all his doing. And he wasn't happy. So he hears that Jesus is coming into town. And he wanted to see who he was. But he was short. He was little. And this crowd is big. And you can only jump up so much to see what's over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed up a sycamore tree to see him. Since Jesus was coming his way. He was desperate in a time where he needed to know something different. So amongst the crowd of all these people seeing Jesus coming in and hearing all the stories of what he's done in people's lives, from healing people to uh, casting out demons to doing all these amazing things, he wanted to know who Jesus was. He was lost without anywhere to be found, and he hugged a tree in hopes. I don't know. I don't know if it was in hopes that Jesus would see him or not, but in hopes that he would see something different something better, something that would change his life. And we get to a point where it pays off. All of the things that he did that were awful paid off into one final little solution here. And you know the story because you've read it when you were a kid, but Jesus reached that spot and he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. It's not very often that a wicked person who cheats people and lies and, and deceives and does all these things would hear about a very righteous man. One who, even if you didn't believe in him completely as, as this coming Messiah, you knew that there wasn't anything that could be held against him. Everybody who ever talked about him talked about him in, in ways that uh, were good. This man does things that we can't explain. And he looks up at you and he says, hey, I want to stay at your house today. Zacchaeus looks and knows what's going on and says, all right, I'm ready. When we're getting stuck in our world, Zacchaeus wasn't just lost in the wilderness of our world. He wasn't even on the radar of somebody who would be a righteous man. Jesus can look out and see each of us where we're at. And if we are desperately needing to know something different in our life and we're, we're going out of our way to say, I need to know what this Jesus looks like. I need to know what he's about. And we hold on to that tree. There's going to be a time where he looks at you and sees you at your moment. It might even be your weakest and says, Gavin, I need to stay at your house today. Am I going to welcome him in? What ends up happening when we do this is we find a different direction, a different path. No longer are we looking for the things that we thought we needed in order to get where we needed to go. We're not looking for the, the tracks that lead us to what we think is where we need to be. Instead, we're saying, God, I'm giving you me. Put me on the track that you want me to be on. Bring me back to you. Help me to find the path that leads me to where you are instead of the path that just keeps pulling me away and pulling me away. Where I think I'm going back, but I'm doing it on my own, and I'm finding the path that goes off and gets me lost to a dead end or a rock bottom. And many of you here, some of you here may have hit that rock bottom at some point in your life. Where you tried everything 
to get clean, but you couldn't, and you, you, you couldn't shake it, and you just found yourself at a bottom <coughs> looking up saying, God, I'm ready, only to find out that you were on a tree, and he looked at you and said, I want to spend time at your house today. We find a way to have a new direction, but with that comes people who want to throw some shade in your direction. It wasn't just the tree that he was standing under, under that gave him shade. It was people in his life that said, these people started to mutter and say, why is he going to be with a guest, to be the guest of a sinner? There are moments where we start to see this kind of group of people all the time. Some of us in here may have fallen into that category at some point where somebody you know or a church is starting to let in people who look like a, a little bit of the riffraff. And guys, got to tell you, if we're not a church that has a bunch of sinners in it, we're doing something wrong. And Jesus spent his time with people who everybody else would talk about. Why would he want to spend his time with them? And this morning in our scripture reading, he talked about a lost sheep. A parable after that is about a woman who loses a coin. A parable after that is about a prodigal son, a son who is lost. In each of those stories, what happens is the shepherd goes out of his way and leaves the rest of the group that is found. To the one that is lost. Desperately seeking it out. Hoping that it hasn't been already devoured by a creature like a lion or something that's out there. And when he finds it, he's overjoyed so much so that he doesn't yank that sheep and say, Why did you run away? Why didn't you just stay with the group? No, he picks that sheep up, puts it on his shoulders. Runs back to the group and says, Everybody come, let's celebrate. The one that I lost is found. The shepherd seeks him out. The woman who loses a coin in her house sweeps it out, pulls everything out, looks desperately for the one coin and finds it. Calls all of her friends. I found it. What I thought was lost is found. Come celebrate with me. A prodigal son who thinks he knows his own way. Dad, give me all of my money. I'm leaving. I don't like what you've told me to do. I want to do it myself. I want to show you that I can do it. What does he do? He goes out and loses it all. To loose living, to women that, that he probably shouldn't have been around, to friends that only wanted to be around him because he was good at buying rounds for everybody else. We're sitting here looking at people, one who looked and found something, a prodigal son who went to find his own and was completely lost and his dad desperately waiting at the porch, looking out at the driveway, hoping to see his son return alive. Finally does, and you know what he does? Something that was not known for men of that time to do. He hiked up his, his tunic, a robe, and he took off running for his son. And he embraced him, gave him his robe, gave him a ring, brought him back, slaughtered a, a, the best calf that they had, and said, it's time to have a party because the son that I thought was dead is alive. Part of us needing to know how to find Jesus when we are lost and, and desperate is knowing that he hasn't stopped giving up searching for you. Sometimes the best way to be found by him is to stop running away. To grab a tree, to hold on, to say, God, I'm ready ready to be found. If we kept reading in, in Luke 19, 7 through 10, what happens after they start saying this, before Jesus could even explain why he would want to be with Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus shuts them up. He does it in a way that, that I think only somebody who everybody knows is an awful cheat of a person. He stands there in front of everybody and he says, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anyone out of anything, I will pay them back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come into this house, because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save the lost. There is a row of people crowding the streets. And Jesus is parading through. And there is a row of people who already thought they had it figured out. There's a row of righteous people. They already had all the right words, right? I know exactly what to say. If you ask me a question, I can tell you about how much this Jesus means to me. There was one who knew he was a sinner, 
who knew he needed this Jesus in his life because he'd already tried to do it himself, who was sitting and took every effort to make sure that not only he could see Jesus, but possibly maybe, just maybe he might be found. And when Jesus calls him down the tree, before he even spent time in his house, before he even spent time with them at all, could you imagine the impact that must have been going on in Zacchaeus' heart before this moment? He was already starting to be found. The moment that he decided that this Jesus was important, that he needed to see him, he was already starting to be found. The moment that he took steps to being in that street at that time, when he's coming by, he's already starting to be found. The moment that he said, I can't just be a face in the crowd, I need to do something more, he was already starting to be found. And Jesus calls him down from that tree and immediately he already feels this rush enough to say, I need to give the stuff that I've cheated back and then some. I need to give to those who don't have anything. I need to be changed. Part of this new direction that comes from being found when we're lost is we don't get to continue to be lost. It's kind of weird how that works out. When we're running around lost in our, our world, or like me, lost in a forest full of trees, when I found my way back, which I know wasn't just all of my doing, people were coming already looking for me. I didn't have to go all the way back. They found me actually halfway. And Unlike Jesus, though, they did say, what were you thinking? <laughs> what were you thinking? Your mom's going to kill me. That's what they told me. Um, but they met me halfway. They guided me the rest of the way back. They helped me to stay on the right path. They helped me to get back to the group. And the lesson that was learned on that day was, stay with <laughs> If I'm lost, don't make it worse. There's a lesson for us in our days every day. When we start to, to choose which path we want, know which one comes from the Lord. This morning in class, we were, we're in James and we're talking about temptations and trials. And we know when we're being tempted by Satan because it, it's one that leads us to destruction and to death where we might be fooled and we might think it's going to bring us joy and bring us hope and bring us all these things that we need in our lives, but instead it just brings us to disappointment, to desperation. But the gifts that come from, from Christ, the ones that are leading us to Him, they come with a different kind of hope. It's an everlasting one. It says that every good and perfect gift comes from the Lord. We know this because it's tested. It's lasting. When you're lost and when you're stuck and, and when you keep finding ways to choose the wrong path, Take a moment to just stop, to sit within it. When I was doing counseling with, um, with couples and, and with kids that struggle with emotional disturbance and different things, there, there's a technique that we use sometimes that's called uh, thought stopping. It sounds weird. It's hard to say if you do it really fast. Thought stopping. Um, what it is, is when they keep saying negative things about themselves and bringing themselves down, you have to teach them to take a moment to stop and understand what they're doing to themselves. And then bring in some reinforcements of the opposite. Let me hear something about yourself that you think is good. We do this often if we're, if we're running away from God and we're doing different things on our own. Take a moment to stop and see who's pursuing you. See the father who is sitting at the porch running down the driveway after you calling you to come back home. It wants to spend time with you. And I hope that our response could be the same, that when we're found, our life actually changes. That we can't look at the mirror and, not, and just see the same person that was there before, but instead one that's changed. And of all people who we can learn from, not just in when you're lost, hug a tree, but when you're lost and you're found, how your life changes is Zacchaeus. And I don't think anybody who knew Zacchaeus before this would say that about him. But he changed and became a generous person instead of a greedy one. Became somebody who loved the Lord instead of one who just loved himself. We start to see a man who looked at what his wrongdoings were and said, God, how can I change to, to repay this? It wasn't because he wanted to impress Jesus. It was because he was already changed by him. 
and he wanted to live a life for him. So look at yourself. Today is a good day to start trying something different. What is it for you that when Christ found you, you were struggling in? What steps have you made towards him? Now, I don't want you to think that in order to do this, that you can find yourself worthy to be in God's presence, because it's the opposite. Jesus found his way to one who was the most unworthy out of the whole group and said, I want to spend time with you today. It wasn't about what he had done before he found Jesus, but it is about what we do after we are found. What are you changing today? What are you doing so that when God looks down at you, he's starting to see more of his reflection in you than a your reflection in yourself? Are you allowing yourself to be more of what God has called you to do, more on his path daily, finding ways to continue to seek him out each and every morning when you wake up, each and every night before you go to bed? God, what can I do? How can I continue? How, how can I allow you full reign of this temple that you've given me? God, I want your Holy Spirit to work within me so that others will know that I am your disciple by the way in which I walk this journey of life that you call me to. This is our, our challenge and our desire each and every day that we arise to be more like Christ. But how do you do it when you're stuck in a world that's lost? Allow yourself to be found. you got to start somewhere. Stop running. Stop looking the other direction. Hug that tree and let Jesus find you and change you. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, you're an awesome and amazing God, and we don't deserve to be in your presence. We don't deserve for you to, to find us worthy, that you would give us your spirit to dwell within us. But God, I, I'm so thankful that you never stop seeking us. That when we are that one lost sheep, that you are desperately going out, hoping to find us before we have been devoured so that you can bring us on your shoulders and that the heavens will rejoice because one who was lost is found. A sinner who was lost to death, repented, and found life. And God, I pray that we don't lose sight of how important that is, but that we choose life, we choose you, instead of the darkness that Satan has for us, God. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. One thing just to leave with. It is way easier to know uh, that you will be extremely lost, even more so when, when darkness comes. One of the reasons that I ran extra fast, the sun was setting on a day where I had already been lost for about four hours. I've always felt like darkness in the middle of nowhere led to like scary things because I watched too much TV. Um, but when we allow darkness to consume, it's so much easier for us to, to not even know what the right path is anymore. We have to take steps each and every day to let that light overwhelm us so that the path is clear, that we don't have to guess, that we know because God is with us. If you're outside of Christ and you don't know what that's like and you want to know more about it, or maybe you want to study.